And I wanted to be a captain on high sea, that was the... But then I had a bummer because um, uh, when I came to elementary school in 1954, the first year, uh, I mean, I must have been so stupid that um, the um, the teacher was talking to my parents after a couple of weeks that I would need special ed education. I mean, and that was... But that was overcome, as you can see. <laughs> Uh, well, I was born in a, in a university town, old university town of about 100,000 people in, in northern Bavaria. So Bavaria is the southeastern part, eastern part of Germany. Um, on the river Main, it's the same river that flies through Frankfurt. And uh, that town uh, happened to be the second most destroyed town in World War II in, in, in the world. It is actually not randomly has a partnership with Nagasaki. Uh, so um, that town was completely destroyed, except for the university hospital, I mean, for Red Cross reasons. And I suppose my parents were doctors. We were living in the university hospital, and we were living in the, uh, in the room, the three of us, for the night guard, you know. So, so my very early memories that I have, it was actually happened when my father was not a brain surgeon, but we, we happened to live in a night guard room of the brain surgery department. And so they took me on this visit to see all the, the recently operated um, patients. And, and then, um, so the, uh, the, the boss, the professor asked me, so do you know, little boy, what I'm doing? And I was saying, you do brain surgery, but they all die. On another, not on a happier note, but um, so as I was really, I mean, this was really in rubble and ruins. Um, but as I had not seen otherwise, I found that quite entertaining. It was also a great place to play with, with your friends. You know, we were playing Ritalis and these little knights, and we imagined those to be medieval fortresses and stuff. And uh, I first went abroad when I was with my parents when I was six years old. And we crossed for one day the, the, the Swiss border and we spent a day in Switzerland. And uh, as there were no ruins in Switzerland, yeah, because as you know, Switzerland didn't participate in World War II, I felt terribly sorry for the Swiss kids. And I was asking my parents, I mean, where are those kids going to play if there are no ruins, right? And I was using the word ruins, but that word ruins was not a bad word for me because I had never seen a world without ruins. It's like, I mean, today, of course, it would be off limits. They would seal off these this, this spaces and would have a lot of action to identify those hand grenades. And people knew that there were hand grenades in the rooms, but, but nothing happens. The parents would just tell you, be careful when you play with hand grenades. <laughs> Don't pull that trigger. Why I don't want to say too many bad things about my parents, but uh, there was this, in Germany specifically, this historical wall uh, between uh, the parents and, and my generation. And I did know that there had been a war, a Krieg. Um, I did know that everything was different before that war. I had heard the word for Führer, I mean, for the, the, the way Germans refer to Hitler. But. Um, the only thing you would ever get out of your parents is that they didn't know anything about anything uh, about what had happened. And for my generation, at least of German intellectuals, that at some point, did make, don't make a decision, but you could describe it as we decided to assume the responsibility for unbelievable crimes that had happened before we were born, which is a paradoxical assignment. What I would say, it's a little bit pathological that being very young and I was also kind of, you know, as I was the 68 generation, I mean, rebellious generation, I like to be provocative with my colleagues and so, um, that, that way of acting young or that feeling of being young um, has never stopped and I'm not saying that's beautiful or this, I mean, I seem to certainly read sometimes pathological, I think somebody my age not necessarily wear blue jeans and t-shirts, etc., uh, etc. Et but um, that's what I associate with coming to age. And um, 
For example, I, I hate people talking about my, my work, you know, capital W, because it always gives me the impression, that, oh, um, now you have reached conclusion and closure. Uh, I mean, I've written a lot, way too much in my life, but uh, I, uh, even now, you know, I mean, like a couple of weeks away from retirement, I'm, most, I'm, I'm feeling I'm at the beginning, but I'm not, not saying this is so wonderful, I'm so cute and I'm so, uh, yeah, so young. Yeah? I mean, I think this, this obsession with being young is a, is a pathology of our age. And uh, I'd like to be more able, perhaps I manage to, to have something of, I mean, in a good sense of the word maturity. Yeah? I mean, I only get motivated if I have questions whose answers I really don't know. If there's any kind of, not trick, but, but important thing that I care about when I'm working with people individually or in class is to make them think that there are no limits to what they can achieve. I do think and I don't even fear that the humanities and arts, as we used to call them, on a process of dissolution. Uh, I, I, I could imagine that they disappear, and as you know, I've been saying and writing, and nobody would notice it, because they have become so marginal and so banal, you know, by doing this whole politically correct thing, uh, by teaching bread and butter courses, by not using the glorious opportunity to try and be better than not only Foucault, but Plato, Kant, and, and Descartes. Uh, that it's, I mean, that the fact that the enrollments are dwindling worldwide is, I don't blame you students' generation. Yeah? Any humanities class that's not brilliant should not be taught. I mean, I know that not every class can be brilliant, but you know, Shakespeare already exists, and Heinrich von Kleist already exists, and Wittgenstein and Heidegger already, I mean, in their textuality, they already exist, and, and to spoil them by surrounding them with banal truisms is, is a sin. Maybe it would be even more depressing if it continued to exist on this level of mediocrity, maybe disappearing and vanishing is a good thing. Yeah. Say, I retire on June 14, uh, 2018, uh, means that this, this work that I have been doing, this quote-unquote career is not a weird word, but has a form, yeah? has a beginning, uh, which was on January 1st, 1975. I uh, taught my first uh, class as a full professor, and it will have an ending at Santiago on June 14th. To have this form and not to peter out, you know, oh, I'm teaching yet another class, and my class is always getting better, which is also not true. And finally, I wanted to go out on a high. I mean, you want to go out when people honestly regret it, and not when they bite their fingernails about when the old guy is finally, finally, finally quitting. Wow. The central person in my life is my wife, and my whole life would be unraveled and would be in dissolution if I wouldn't live with her. I mean, I mean if I'm this person who never reaches closure, uh, maturity, I mean, I think in many ways, uh, she's a much more mature person, but, but she's a center, not a boring center. I mean, you know that she, she has her profession as an artist and she's very successful and I'm super proud of that. But uh, she's also, I mean, I'm just every day I'm looking forward to coming home. I think um, I would be able to would love to be able to fly like a bird. And the main feeling is when, not, not when they fly fast, but this kind of hovering, when they almost stop. And, and, and then I'm imagining how they experience that. And then I'm imagining that their brains are so small that they probably don't experience shit. But I'm not saying with the human brain, but that feeling of almost standing in the air and then letting yourself go that if I had a one-time chance, I would love to do that. <laughs>